Well, this morning we continue with our series, Old Testament Prophecy Fulfilled. So I don't know if you can remember if you were here last week, the ridiculous way in which I started, but I started with my flying hat on and my goggles. And the reason I did that is that we are in a plane or a time machine as we go along. And uh, we're going to have uh, uh, one journey, one flight. Uh, last week, I was with a couple. I took their wedding over 20 years ago. And they're getting divorced. They're both atheists. And they, they both said, look, we've only got a few years left. We'd prefer to spend it with other people. And I was sitting there thinking, the problem is you just have those years left. You have no big story you're in. It's the exact opposite for us today. And here is our flight plan uh, that we're in. We're not a bit of DNA stranded in the universe. This is one story, one journey. And the flight plan for us is London now, back to Israel's uh, uh, time in, in Isaiah's day, 740 BC, then on to Jerusalem, AD 33, and then back to communion today. Chastened, I hope, we'll find. But we'll head to Easter in Jesus' day and back here. And that's what we're doing. And I guess... If there was a title for the flight that we're on, so, so as we're, we're on this flight, what would, what would we call it, uh, ladies and gentlemen? I think the name would be as follows. The history of Israel, rejection of God. Stubborn rebellion. Uh, that's who's on the flight. And Isaiah has the thankless task of exposing the sins of his fellow Israelites and warning them of the judgment to come. Not a great job to have. So how does he do that? How's he going to communicate this message, such an unpleasant message? Well, in the passage, Isaiah's strategy actually is to sing. He says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be a minstrel, and I'm going to sing of a hillside. Now, we all love a song, don't we? And that's how he's going to get behind the citadels of his listeners' minds, uh, singing to his audience. It'll be an end-of-harvest traditional entertainment festival. And so can you see in verse 1 what he's going to do? I'll sing for the one I love. A song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. Well, they're all listening. How lovely. What a lovely song. And so, so there they are. And, and what happened to that hillside? Can we look down verse 2? Can we see it's a lovely song? He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut down a wine press as well. And so after all this work that's been done for the vineyard... Well, what does he ask for? He's just invested so much in his love for Israel, for the vineyard. What's the request? Have a look down, second half of verse 2. Do we see? Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, and now the knife goes in. Now's reality. Do you see there? But it yielded only bad fruit. And actually, when we have a commentary on the bad fruit that's come out of this vineyard, despite all the love and concern, have a look at verse 7. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice but saw bloodshed, for righteousness but heard cries of distress. Now, this is very clever. Chris Wright uh, uh, told me this. He looked for justice, mispat, but saw only mispat. You see, the words are, are, are just changed a bit. For righteousness, sadqua, but actually heard cries of distress, sakwa. So very clever as he sings. But he says, where's the social justice? What's happening to the poor in this culture? Uh, well, what's happening in terms of the, the way in which one person after another, whether they be widow or orphan or whoever, is manipulated and destroyed? And so there are two words that define the, 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 the words following, those of the vineyard. Can you see as we look down, woes and judgment, those are the two key words. Introduces the denunciation, woe of certain sills, sins, and therefore introduces the judgments that will happen. And, and actually, as we look down, what is the bad fruit? Well, there it is. Woe to the greedy and the land grabbing, 5 verse 8. Woe to the arrogant who defy God, verse 18. Do you see in verse 18? Woe to those who draw sin along with cords of deceit and wickedness as with cart ropes. And on it goes. Woe to the self-justifying and the sophists. I love verse 20. It's so striking. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Don't we have that in our culture? <laughs> Not just then. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So here are the woes. 
And here is the, the certainty of judgment, and yet Israel do not change. Despite this, the flight is still stubborn rebellion. And so we fly on. We fly on to Easter week, AD 33. Can you in your Bibles see that this is one story? Let's flick on to the next passage and to page 988. It's one story. We're still on the plane, rejection of God. And we see, come to the passage we had last week, but the second half of it, page 988, Matthew 21. Here we are again. We've gone 700 years forward. And the question is, who? That's the question that, 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 that we have here. Who is it that rides into Jerusalem? Can you see uh, what the crowd are saying? Verse 10 of chapter 21, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, that's his name. The prophet, that's his role, from Nazareth in Galilee, that's his home. But the question is, is that all he is? So we're asking the question, who is he? And the answer actually is, no, this is God's son coming to Jerusalem to claim his vineyard. He's not just a prophet, he's more than that. And so as he comes into Jerusalem, what do we see him doing? He is saying of everything, it's mine. It belongs to me. So let's have a look. The cult. Do you remember what it said in verse 3 of the cult? The Lord needs it. The Lord needs them. And then to the city, uh, verse 9, 10, 11. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's the Lord coming. He might be on a cult, but he's the Lord. And then, of course, he enters the temple, verse 12. And what does he say in the temple? Have a look down as we come to verse 13. My house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. It's my house. As Jesus goes in, this is my father's house. I'm clearing it. And then even the natural world is under the authority of Jesus. As he, that's who this is. He's coming to his vineyard. And the natural world, do you see the cursing of the fig tree, verse 18? Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. Immediately. Absolute authority over the natural world. And at this point... The religious leaders of the day can no longer ignore this Galilean preacher who has come right into their front room, into their parlor, and challenged their authority. So they ask the question of verse 23. Can we see the question being asked? Here it is. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests, the elders of the, uh, uh, of the people, came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus, who do you think you are behaving like this? And then Jesus evades their question, and instead he goes to the parable of Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, which will both answer their question and explain what is happening at this turning point in human history, which leads us to our communion service today. So what do we learn in this haunting parable, this story with spiritual cutting edges told by Jesus just hours before he died and containing within it the throbbing thought of the agony of crucifixion? What are we to learn? How do we view this moment in history? What's our part in it? Well, as we come to this parable, we begin with God's generosity. Can we see God's generosity? Let's have a look down. Verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. The bells would be ringing, Isaiah 5. He, he put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. So, so those listening, would, would they'd know their Bibles. It's resonating. And can we see here the thoroughness of God's loving care to these tenants. The thoroughness of it. The vineyard is completely equipped. They had all they needed. And this truth is timeless. It speaks of every age to every race. This isn't just a polemic against the religious leaders of Jesus' day. We are all implicated here 
And we are to see that there is no meanness in God's provision in his world. There's no meanness. He's neglected nothing in providing for us as creatures in his world. He is so generous. So view the world from space and what a rich, fertile, colorful planet it is. So from space you can see literally millions of acres of fields of grain in Ukraine. Rich, fertile soil to feed the world. As you look at Ukraine, don't doubt God's generosity. There's the grain, there's the bread basket. It's what we're doing with it. But it's there. There's enough food to feed the world. God's generosity. Secondly, in this parable, we come to man's responsibility. Matthew 21, verses 33, 34. And we see that we're tenants. Can you see halfway through 33, right down there, second last line, then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When harvest time approached, he sent his servants to, to the tenants to collect his fruit. Then he rented it. So the human race, you and I, are tenants of a property. Can I tell you, The Christian faith can't move forward unless you understand that's your identity. We are tenants. We're tenants. We're tenants of a property that we did not create, we have not earned, and that we do not own. But we're trusted with this world as the tenants are trusted with the vineyard. Brother, sister, you're a tenant. You're not an owner. The famous green campaign poster is correct when it proclaims, here is the world, don't spend it all at once. Me, you, we're given lives to do what we like with. We're given time, choices, resources, relationships. God is so generous and he gives us real responsibility. So we see God's generosity. We see man's responsibility. And then thirdly, as we move on, we come to God's patience. God's patience. Can we look down and see verses 35 and 36? The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them in the same way. God's patience. Uh, Do you know, I've got a a friend. uh, She's from Ulster. She taught uh, uh, at a little primary school in the Church of Ireland, and uh, she was their form teacher, so she taught them everything. And she decided one day to do a project with these little ones in order to teach them about God the Creator and man his creatures. So she got them into table groups of six and with a, with a, 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 gave them around a, a, a board and a table and gave them a huge amount of plasticine and Lego. And she said to them, make a world, these little ones. Well, the children labored for a couple of hours and they, um, they, 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 they put in people and animals and trees and gardens and houses and cars and mountains and rivers. And then she said... Now, I want you, as the makers of this world, to write down how these people should live. And the children set about writing constitutions. Couldn't spell the word, but they started it. Uh, uh, Communities. So how should they live? They should live in peace. They should respect certain rules. They should look after the animals. They should love each other. And then, after about three hours, she asked them, what would you do if these people decided that you, the makers, did not exist and that they could treat each other as they liked? Well, apparently, one normally very placid, quiet little girl looked up and her eyes flared with anger and she blurted out, we'd rip their legs off. (laughs) Well, fortunately, in this parable and in history, God is more patient more long-suffering than those children were. So in the Old Testament, he sends his messengers, his prophets, in this parable, a servant to collect some fruit from the vineyard. So he sends prophet after prophet after prophet to these people. Not over months, not over years, not over decades. Ladies and gentlemen, over centuries, over centuries, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, Zephaniah, Micah, prophet after prophet, lesson after lesson, And the fruit of the vineyard that the prophets called for is the same fruit those Belfast children wanted. 
obedience to the Creator's loving, wise instructions. And, and that is the debt we owe our Maker, to love God, to love one another. Those are his instructions so that we flourish. And so he says, don't commit adultery because he's faithful. He says, don't steal because he's a giving God. He says, don't lie because he's a God of truth. His laws reflect his character. And he says, trust me, trust me and obey. And so the choice is overwhelming. I can drive any car I like and drive where I like, but God calls me to be loving to others in the way I drive my car. Yet, despite God's generosity, despite man's responsibility, despite God's patience, what we see is man's rebellion. Verses 35 and 36. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time. And these tenants treated them in the same way. So these people in the vineyard, uh, these people placed in the vineyard as tenants, act as if they are owners, as though they are the owners. That is the mindset change. Do you see it? As though the landlord's messengers were robbers, trying to take the property unlawfully. And the trust of the owner in allowing them freedom is totally abused. So here's the issue. This is what happens. They use their freedom to deny the owner his rights. That's the picture. They use their freedom to deny the owner his rights. And as human beings, we do not naturally welcome the idea of a God who has the right to to rule our lives. Oh, yeah, we like a benign deity who will allow us to do what we like and and, and, and then allow us to be happy ever after. Yeah, we'll have that. But, But actually, but actually, not a God who calls for obedience to his law. And we've seen that this week at Lambeth. So a whole section of bishops in the Church of England and in the wider Anglican communion who are saying, well, God, you know, don't interfere. We're not going to have your law. We'll make up the rules in terms of what we do. But, I mean, you know, we'll have the church, but on our terms. And then we'd like to live happily ever after. But we won't have a God who calls for obedience to his word and holds us accountable for how we live in his world. I have a friend who was trying to grow, here we are, rhubarb, uh, he was beginning to garden and he tried to grow, grow it. And in one of the gardening books, he read these words. It made him laugh. He said, rhubarb, it said, rhubarb resents interference. It's quite a thought, isn't it? So as the plant's there and you're wandering through the garden, there's the rhubarb and it sort of snarls as you approach. It resents interference. Well, that's these tenants. That's us. God has made us and he sustains us so we get each breath because of him. And they resent and he resent interference. That's how we treat the God who made us. So we come to God's last resort. Where are we now? His last resort. And I wonder if you can hear the poignancy of this as we read verse 37. Do we see? Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. They'll respect my son. I mean, they've ignored the other messengers, but this is my son. They'll respect my son. So we've had God's generosity, man's responsibility, God's patience, man's rebellion. And then he sends his son. And here is the answer to the question of the Jewish leaders in verse 23, back over the page. This is the answer, isn't it? To the question, who do you think you are? By what authority do you do this? And the answer is, God, I'm doing it on God's authority. I'm his son. So, ladies and gentlemen, God's love and patience is so great that at last he sends his son. He's last but not least. And just to say here, he is not another in the series of prophets or the climax of the series, or even the greatest in the series. No, this is an emissary of an altogether different sort from those who've preceded him. So what? What will these tenants do with God's Son? What will they do? 
He sent his son. That's the great question we've got here. What will the tenants do? Well, let's have a look. Can we see verses 38, 39? But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. Let's kill him. And then we'll take the inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. I mean, it is just staggeringly poignant, isn't it? These words written hours before Jesus dies. And please notice, this is no accident. They didn't kill the heir by mistake because they failed to recognize him. No, it was precisely because they did know who he was that they killed him. You see, what the tenant farmers really wanted was not to enjoy the vineyard, but to own the vineyard. They were placed in the vineyard as very privileged tenants, but they wanted to be owners so, that, so they could not tolerate the, the presence of the owner. That's what's happening here. I am my own is the great rebellion and longing of the human heart, and it seeks to destroy Jesus. It's why in Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed against those who, in their wickedness and godlessness, suppress the truth about Jesus. The heart of sin is to destroy Jesus. I'm my own. I will not have this transcendental interferer come near me. I am my own. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, the Christian faith never makes sense. It never comes alive unless I can get inside the justice and the outrage of verses 40 and 41. So, understandably, Jesus asks the question. Verse 40, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? I mean, it's a good question, isn't it? He's created the vineyard. He's given them freedom. He's been patient for hundreds of years. He has sent his son to them. What will he do when they kill his son? Well, interestingly, as we look down verse 41, those listening give the answer. Jesus doesn't give the answer, but the injustice of it leaps out of the page. Verse 41, he'll, cut, he'll bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. So he asked them, what do you think he should do? Well, he'll bring them to a wretched end. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crops at harvest time. Now, that is not God's desire to bring those tenants to a wretched end. He has been generous and patient for centuries. He's even sent his only son. But in this talk of judgment, the issue is, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot stop God being God. You can't stop him being God. London is filled with people who believe you can stop God being God. But you cannot. Eventually, with tears, having been so patient, God says to us, and all, they, all we know, well, he'll bring those wretches to a wretched end. As they go through decades of shaking their fist at God, taking the gifts, fun, family, friends, falling in love, food, fitness, ignoring him, ignoring his son, there will come a day when nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything, everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Everything. You can't stop God being God. He sees everything. He's given us every cell of our bodies. He sees what we've done. He sees how we've thought. He sees how we've treated him and others. Nothing is hidden from God's sight. So is that it? Is that it? Is that the end? God has been generous, he's been patient. There's nevertheless judgment against those who've rebelled against him, particularly those who have suppressed the knowledge of his son. Is that it? 
Well, no, because of the psalm that Jesus quotes. Can we look down verse 42? And we were talking last week how this is a great psalm to sing on the plane as we go through life and as we realize the great story we're in. And here's another verse in that psalm that makes it the most marvelous life psalm. And Jesus, hours before his death, then quotes these verses from Matthew 21 and from Psalm 118. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it's marvelous in our eyes. Uh, That psalm takes the fact that God takes hopeless, desperate, impossible situations like the one we're in when we realize that everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And we're on this plane, but we're in a terrible state. And he turns those situations around and he rescues people. He rescues them from the punishment they deserve. And so this Psalm 118 is about finding foundations we can rely on. The illustration here is of a great block of stone. Uh, that's been rejected by the builders of a building and it's just been flung across a building site and it's getting in the way, it's being tripped over and then a new architect comes and he comes along and he sees the stone he goes, ah, oh, that's exactly what I need for the cornerstone. He's going to build the building around it. And of course the psalmist was looking down history to Jesus who'd be rejected by the people of Israel so that they would butt their shins on him and they would clash with him and they would shout, crucify him, crucify him. But all along, Jesus would be the foundation stone of a new community. Is he yours? Is he yours? When the storm of COVID hits, where are your feet? What's your foundation? And this is the marvelous thing that Jesus does. He dies so that we can remain in God's vineyard forever. I mean, we have these moments when we we head back into Genesis chapter 2, when it's just marvelous. We've all had them. There just couldn't be better moments. I remember being up Table Mountain with my twin sister years ago, and, and I mean, it just was absolutely glorious there in Cape Town. It was just a moment of the new creation as we looked out. There are these moments. And Jesus says, I want you to stay in the new creation, in the vineyard forever. But as rebellious tenants, we, 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 you know, what should happen to us? Well, we should come to a wretched end. But amazingly, hell can be pardoned. Amazingly, it can be escaped from. At the heart of the Christian faith is being saved from hell, through the cross, for heaven. So as we come to communion now, there is only one question. What will you do with God's Son? Everything's going to be uncovered and laid bare before the Creator. And the question for you is, what will you do with God's Son?